A-side's got hype, but people root for the underdog. There may be a main event, but don't sleep on the undercard. Welcome to the B-side, you can take your sneak side, take you for a sweet ride. Ah, info is supply, worldwide, thanks for flipping to the B-side, yeah. Hosted by Brian McKay. McKay. Listeners, I have an absolute treat for you in this episode. As we continue to preview the 2021 NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament, play-by-play, studio host, this woman can and has done it all. She is also a great follow on Twitter, at Cindy Brunson AZ. For all things women's basketball, Pac-12, basically anything that happens on the West Coast, she got you covered. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Pac-12 Network, Cindy Brunson. BMAC, thank you for that introduction. The check is in the mail. <laughs> well, welcome to the B side. So happy to be here. This is my first time, hopefully, not my last time. So, super stoked that you had me today. No doubt I will have you back. Do not worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let's get started. Let's talk about Washington State. First sure. time in the tournament in over 30 years. Tell my listeners about Coach, Coach Etheridge's team and as they head into Texas to play South Florida in the Riverwalk region. I tell you what, this is a, um, a deal. Well, first of all, it's the Mercado re- region. There are no oh, Pac-12 I, I, teams. Oh, no worries. There are no Pac-12 teams in the Riverwalk region, which is right. where Connecticut lives. Yes. And I think that is very interesting. Of course, we can talk about that a uh, little bit down the road here uh, right. while I'm with you. But yeah, I think that's why UConn has a great shot if Baylor doesn't get in the way to uh, make it to the Final Four just because there is no Pac-12 team in that region. But I digress. And Washington yeah. State University, BMAC, what a story. For the first time in three decades, this team is in the NCAA tournament and Every time this team takes the floor, it's a first. First time in the top 25 in program history earlier this season. Came this close to having a freshman lead the league in scoring for the first time in Pac-12 history And Charlie Sledger Walker. She was nipped out in the very end in the last week of action by Ari McDonald, who's kind of awesome and has led the league in scoring and steals for three straight years. So not too shabby. Uh, But nobody knew at the beginning of the season how special Charlize and her sister, Crystal, would be together and could help elevate Washington State University. A quick nugget on Charlize. She's from New Zealand along with her sister and her mom is a two-time Olympian with New Zealand and coaches the tall firms down there. Now here's the deal. When Charlize was young, I'm talking 12 years old, she had skills so much so that her mom put her in a game for the tall firms as a 12 year old and she quickly scored six points. All of the women, mind you, this is Olympic quality people who are over the age of 18 and beyond pooping out there. And this 12 year old Charlize just goes and fills it up in just a few minutes. So they created the Charlie's Ledger Walker rule. You oh. have to be 15 years old to even step on the floor now in Olympic style basketball in New Zealand. So she literally had to wait three years because she was so awesome. So that just gives you a hint as to uh, how good Charlize is. She's a three level scorer. Her basketball IQ is through the roof and she's a big part of the reason why Washington State was able to pack its bags for San Antonio. That's, that's an awesome story, and I, I, I vaguely remember hearing that some somewhat before, but that's that's pretty cool. And the fact that they were so scared that she was so good that they made her wait three more years before she could play. Right? <laughs> Unbelievable! Wow. Well, um, that's an awesome story. I can't wait to see what Washington State does from here. They're going to be up it against is, a, South Florida is no joke. No, right? and they can they can put it in the basket. 
right? Jose Fernandez knows what he's doing. Everybody on the floor can shoot the three. They have three for sure double digit scores and a fourth, you know, just like 9.8 points per game. Right. Um, so yeah, they can fill it up and they have the second leading rebounder in the country on the roster. It's formidable. And South Florida, look, they got a chip on their shoulder. They right. thought they should have been a higher seed. Um, and they aren't happy about being eight and they aren't happy about playing somebody that is not a regular in the NCAA tournament. And they have, they have something to prove, you know, they have three straight one and dones. They want to get past that. And it's a program that has put legit players into the WNBA before bulls have something to prove. It's going to be interesting. Let's stay in that region. Okay. Uh, and talk to me about Arizona. They've, Lost their last two games of the conference season, was yeah. ousted in the Pac-12 semis by UCLA. Yeah, uh, they have been they've been one of my favorite teams. And when when Ari McDonald announced that she was going to the WNBA, I was the first to put out on Twitter, "Okay, Arizona's to the Final Four. You you heard me say it now. I'm calling it. They're going okay. to the Final Four. <laughs> They're going to make a run. So, I like it. where are they heading into their first round matchup with Stony Brook? Well, I, I'm not worried about Stony Brook. Um, my concern for Arizona is they got to find the offense. Yeah. For so many years, it was Ari McDonald and really nobody else helping out. The last two seasons, uh, and I go back to the WNIT championship team, the team had some offensive help and they showed flashes of that this season. However, in their losses on the year and in the Pac 12 tournament, the offense, not named McDonald, checked out of the gym. Now, they have the tools and the capability. I love your pick for them to get to the Final Four. I definitely have Arizona in the Sweet 16. But folks named Kate Reese, Sam Thomas, Trinity Baptiste, as well as Elena Pueyo, the best three-point shooter on the team, yes. has to get herself off the milk carton and show up and fill it up. That is when Arizona is its most dangerous. I had them against the University of Washington. They hit 75% from three. San Thomas, a career high six triples. They have the ability to fill it up. They just have to do it. They have to stop watching Aerie, who is so fun to watch. I am bummed that I won't be able to watch her anymore in the back 12. But the team just has to score the basketball because the defense is legit. The defense has been packed up. It has made it to the state of Texas. It is formidable, harassing, haranguing, everything you want in a legit top-level defense. They just have to score the basketball. They can't leave it all on airy shoulders. Yeah. No, indeed. Uh, let's move to the Hemisphere region. UCLA made a run to the Pac-12 championship, seemed to have some momentum heading into, into their matchup with Wyoming. Uh, give us a little bit, a little info on the Bruins. I love what Corey Close has done with so little. She has two, four, and five star players sitting in Australia right now that could not get into the country because of the global pandemic. And because of that, the bench is very thin. And yet, the Bruins have found a way to not shrink from excellence, but exceeding expectations. They have been phenomenal. Of course, when you have Charisma Osborne on your roster, as well as Michaela Onyenwede, excellence is within your grasp. I will be curious to see how UCLA handles playing, you know, one day, day rest, next day, because they didn't run into that very much during the conference season. And they didn't run into it very much during the Pac-12 tournament because of the day of rest built in before the championship game. So I'm my heart is with Corey Close and everything that the Bruins are doing. I definitely have them into the Sweet 16. But beyond that, I'm scared that the lack of substitutions that are able to score and match what Osborne and Onion Wede do when they do need a, a little bit of a rest. Um, makes me a little nervous, but I never count UCLA out. In one of my favorite opening round matchups, staying in that same region, we have Oregon State going up against Florida State. 
Oregon Can State. Can I tell you something? Be, I hate to cut you off, but no, no. I am so excited about yes. Oregon State. It, that team has won eight of its last 10 games. And the true freshman, Talia von Olhoffen, is so crazy, legit, it's not even funny. Scott Ruick's playbook is no joke. I mean, I don't understand it. And some of our elite analysts in the Pac-12 have trouble wrapping their arms around it. And that freshman has embraced it, and she has taken it and run with it. It's unbelievable. And BMAC, B basketball in the state of Washington is ginormous. It's smaller schools, but some of the best basketball played in the state, and that is where Talia is from in Pasco. And if she had stayed in high school and finished out her career, she would have been the all-time leading scorer, men's or women's, in the state wow. of Washington. Yes, she is a bucket and a three-level scorer. And her confidence, I think, is going to at least get Oregon State into the Sweet 16, no problem, maybe farther. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's saying something there. That's pretty good. <laughs> uh, Alamo region. Yes. Oregon Ducks, they kind of stumbled a little bit toward the end of the season, losing four of their last five to end mm -hmm. the conference play. Um, give us a little something to expect from Coach Gray's team heading okay. into their matchup with South Dakota. To do that, I'm going to take you back to their last matchup against Oregon State, mm -hmm. where it looked like the Beavers were just going to run the Ducks out of the gym at the Pac-12 tournament. And then Kelly Graves went young. He brought in a lot of freshmen. And they made some hay. They cut that deficit down to single digits. And all of a sudden, Scott Ruick is using timeouts and adjusting and the whole thing. And because of that, I think Coach Graves got the memo. We're going to have to reinvent ourselves to make some hay in the tournament. So look for the Ducks to go a lot younger. Of course, we don't know Pow Pow's situation, the point guard. She was right. in the boot. Um, may have to sit out that first weekend and could be back beyond that. Cross your fingers if you're a Ducks fan. But if they can't have Pow Pow, what do the Ducks look like? And we saw that at the Pac-12 tournament. So I'm excited to see how Kelly rolls it out because that team is all about swag. If they get a little momentum, which they should on in the opening round game, watch out for the Ducks. They're ready to fly and soar in San Antonio. You you heard it. You heard it here first. Um <laughs> Pick, pick Oregon to make a run if you want to win your bracket pool. Right. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, the number one overall seed, Stanford. Ooh. Winners of the Pac-12 tournament. They play Utah Valley State in the opening round. Tell us a little bit about the Cardinals. The Cardinals are unbelievable. Stanford is loaded for bear. And if the Cardinals don't win the Final Four, and the national championship in San Antonio, I will be surprised. They are easily the best team I have seen play this season. The balance is ridiculous. The length is stunning. For the fans that do go to the games in San Antonio, pay attention to what Tara Vanderveer can roll off of the bench at any given moment. She has not one, but two players, 6'5", who can shoot the three and shoot it at a great percentage. Yes. When Tara goes to the bench, there is no offensive drop off. And that's remarkable. The defense is stout thanks to co-defensive player of the year, Anna Wilson. She makes every opposing night, uh, point guard have nightmares. And don't forget, Kiana Williams is from San Antonio. Yes. That guard, wants to win the title. It was her goal going into last season before everything was shut down. And Kiana is a chameleon. She is whatever Stanford needs in the moment. If they have to have big threes, she steps up. If they have to have a big defensive stop, she is there. If they have to have a ton of assists to set up somebody like Brink or Jones, she does that. So she can do anything that is needed. It's why her stats, while impressive, just don't jump off the page at you because she literally morphs to whatever is needed game by game. It speaks to her IQ and her incredible talent level and her stewardship of this team. It is my secret hope that 
Tara wins for the Pac-12 for the first time since she last won it in 1992. Wow. I think that would be so fitting for the GOAT and the all-time winningest coach in women's basketball. Yes, indeed. Well, Cindy, <laughs> thank you so much again for joining me today. I really appreciate you coming on. And I'm please, uh, I'll always be Matt. Come on now. I know it. Well, make sure you enjoy the tournament. I know I will. And as always, I am your host, Brian McKay. And thank you for flipping to the B-Side. You can listen to the B-Side podcast at Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, Spotify, and TuneIn. Also, be sure to check out our YouTube channel. Please be sure to follow our show on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at the B-Side Podcast. That's at the B-Side Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to get all the updates and different things happening with our podcast. Be sure to email us any questions, comments, what you think you like about the show, what you don't like. Our email address is the B Side Podcast at gmail.com. That's the B Side Podcast at gmail.com. The A Side's got hype, but people root for the underdog. There may be a main event, but don't sleep on the undercard. Welcome to the B Side. You can take your sneak side, take you for a sweet ride. Ah, info is so fly. Worldwide, thanks for flipping to the B Side. Yeah. Hosted by Brian McKay. McKay. McKay.